Queens, New York, home of Marley Ma and the Juice Crew, Cool G Rap, and many other notable hip hop artists. But the early 90s introduces to a new generation. Well, I, I remember when they dropped Juvenile Hell. I, I remember I had the single, it was like on peer pressure and hit it from the back. And there was a DJ premiere remix. And those were the popular songs by them. But the album, the actual album Juvenile Hell, nobody was checking for that album. Like, if we just being real, nobody was checking for that album. Um, you might have heard the single, you might have seen it on Video Music Box. Um, but you wasn't really checking for Mob Deep. Yeah, I think with Juvenile, Juvenile Hell feels like a demo in a, in a lot of ways. And you know, like, I, I think P and Hav will say, you know, they're well versed in sort of hip hop history. And I, I you know, I think that it kind of felt like rhyme school and, and, and them kind of finding the pockets of, of their influences, who they wanted to sound like. And you know, it was good. And as much as, you know, the execution was there and, and, and you know, there was remnants of, of, you know, who they would later become. Um, but like its name, Juvenile Hell, you know, it, it sounded, it, there was some amateur uh, um, inflection to it. I had Juvenile Hell, and I thought Juvenile Hell was an incredible album. You know, as raw and rugged as it was, you got Large Professor production, I think Premier might have did a joint on there. Um, it, you know, you had Hit It From The Back, you had a bunch of stuff on there that was like just crazy. And then by the time Infamous came out, I mean, it seemed like a, a different group. It would be wrong to say they put on their capes because, they, you know, they, they weren't rescuing anybody. They were trying to survive. So it, it was like, you know, Juvenile Hell's brand new Tim's, uh, the Infamous is, you know, a Hennessy stain Tim. That's what New York was. It was a bunch of kids from a certain neighborhood that just ran together. It wasn't a gang. It was a crew, you know. So to hear their crew rhymes from Juvenile Hell, jump all the way to infamous where it was like whoa it was it was a story it was a sound i hate saying it was like a movie because a lot of rappers say that about their <laughs> music but that album was like this deep dark movie that represented these two kids from queensbridge and it was i believe although there have been so many rap legends to come out of queensbridge it was a very different perspective like all historical hip hop moments, we always remember where we were when it happened. April 25th, 1995 was no different. I was in high school in Brooklyn. I was going to Brooklyn Tech, um, you know, running around, cutting class, running around Fulton Street Mall, going to B Street to cop records. And, and when Mob Deep came out, you know, I, I was going through some things, man. I was, I was old enough, um, experimenting, you know what I'm saying, getting into fights. Um, you know, right before um, Mob Deep, you know, was like Onyx was really popular and DOS Effects, and it was rooted in the street, but it was different. Mob Deep felt more like reality. Um, and so some of the things they were saying, I wasn't necessarily living that life, but it was going on right around me, right in front of my face. I just remember like that Friday evening, getting on the number 20 bus, going to Military Circle Mall. They had a movie theater like right outside of it. And um, it was like one of the nights of all nights. I, I was by myself, just just in a zone. And I went to inside. I went inside the Military Circle Mall, and um, I bought the Infamous album. And I went across the street to the movie theater to go see Friday, the movie Friday with Ice Cube that just came out that day. So. I was in hip hop heaven that day. For me, I mean, I was, I was only 15. I, I was 15 years old. Uh, I, I, I distinctly remember buying the infamous album. You know, it's like when you're younger, the way that you get hip hop albums, it's usually like somebody dubs a tape, it gets passed on to you from like your man's big brother who, who passed, they, they stole it, they dubbed it, you get a dub of a dub, and that, you know, that's kind of how you got it. But for, for the infamous, I, I distinctly remember buying that uh, in a mall. I bought it at the wall. I had the Lifetime sticker, um, which that wasn't worth anything. But uh, no, it, it it was it was you know for me it was a very serious moment to to kind of purchase that and, and you know with my, my own money and it's probably because I had a mustache I was able to buy an album with an explicit album cover. It was one of them albums, man. We could just press play from beginning to end, um, all 16 tracks from from the 41st side to uh, the party's over. All 16, banging, blood curdling, bone chilling. It was epic, man, it was epic. 1995, a monumental year for hip hop. With Nas instilling hope throughout Queensbridge, 
the streets still needed a soundtrack. It was hard coming up in New York at that time. You know, you definitely had to carry yourself a certain way, um, especially us when we were in high school. I mean, I'm, I was from Brooklyn, but we used to go to the Bronx. We used to go to Queens if you had a girlfriend, you know, in Queens or uptown in Washington Heights or a house party in the Bronx. Like, we used to travel and um, you used to have to know how to carry yourself in different hoods and in different environments. And that didn't necessarily mean that you had to be tough or be a killer, but you know, you had to know how to walk and move and if need be, kind of defend yourself. And Mob Deep was a soundtrack to those travels. When the Infamous came out, they were on Loud Records. And Loud Records was dominating hip hop at the time. I mean, obviously, yes, you had Def Jam, but Loud was that other label. The climate of hip hop in 95 was one of the most competitive out there. I mean, you talk about um, Biggie and Tupac was still alive. They were setting the bar for everything. You know, I, I think like with the Mob album, it was in that era of the New York Renaissance. You know, you had Elmatic, Ready to Die, everything that Wu-Tang was doing. Exhibit, Common, LL Cool J was still popping in. And rather than sort of like the, 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 the cherry on top, uh, you know, Mob was sort of like that like crust formation at the bottom. You know, it was like, it was really gritty and, and you know, when they collaborated with their peers, like, you know, they kind of brought out that kind of sound. So, you know, records that they did with uh, Wu-Tang members or, or records that they did with Nas, you know, it, it always got those guys some of their best verses. Nas had just dropped his magnum opus about a year earlier, almost a year to the date, actually, that The Infamous came out. And um, I just was so proud of my borough. I was living in VA at the time, but I just was so proud of my borough of Queens that, Damn, we got back-to-back -back classics in consecutive years. The environment of New York was just so dope, you could not penetrate it. You know, the only people that was really rocking around that time was snooping them, you know, on, on, uh, on the West Coast, but New York hip-hop was so hard. Like, hard joints was playing on the radio. There was no lack. <laughs> there was just an abundance of great material, and it was an abundance of people playing out classic albums. The real street stuff before that in New York and before Nas, obviously, was like cool G-Rap. And, and it was different with G-Rap, because G-Rap was more like the mafioso. He was like a Don, like the Don Perignon lifestyle. Like, Mob Deep was those kids that, when they came on the train, that you might you might have rode the train with them. And you had to just, all right, be on guard real quick one time because it could go down, you know what I mean? It's just the fact that it looked like Mob was just a bunch of dudes trying to figure out New York life. Unlike any other artist at the time, Mob Deep captured the sound of the streets in its rawest form. That sound was the infamous. The way that the album was produced was this very raw hip hop sound. And it really had this thread that went all the way through. And it was this their story, it was Mob Deep's story. And I think that what made it different from something like Illmatic, which was around the same time, Illmatic was this album full of hope, right? So even though you got to see what was going on in Queensbridge, you saw it from this hopeful perspective. It was more musical, whereas I feel like The Infamous was very dark, and it was like, no, this is what's going on. There was almost no hope to that album. And I think, you know, with Nas, it's sort of like the psychology of a man and the decisions he makes. And Mob Deep, certainly beginning with the infamous, it's really about uh, kind of a uh, sociological uh, view of man in conflict. They were looking at the same thing, but it was almost like Nas was looking out of his window and he was painting this scene. And the infamous felt like they were the cats that he was looking at. They're out there doing that dirt. Those dudes is out there holding the guns. They busting the guns. They slicing kids. They doing all that. That was their, you know, that was their life. Not to say that Nas couldn't run with them, but it was just Nas was in a different zone. And, you know, you hear about the gunfire. And, I mean, you hear a lot of that even in the skits on the infamous. And, and you know, the, the way that the album started with a song and then it went back to a, a, an intro, excuse me, a, a, an interlude, you know, that was very cinematic. You know, like with movies, they, they kind of start in the middle, then you come back and kind of get the explanation. 41st Side was, was, was the first song, and 
it was just a, it was just a bone chilling experience. Nothing really sounded like that. You know, there, there was traces of it in other albums, but when the infamous arrived, you know, it was menacing. What Havoc was doing and what so many great producers from New York that, that were thriving at the time, they had mastered the art of what you call making a tunnel banger. Havoc's production, you know, people didn't know that he was producing it. I don't think they knew that he was trying to produce on the first one. Second one, he, he had started, you know, th those snares, man. They probably used the same snares for like two or three of those joints. And then Q-Tip jumping in doing what he did, tweaking everything. Um, it was just incredible to see, man. You know, you, you hear songs like Right Back At You, and you know, like, it, it sounds like Descent. You know what I mean? It sounds like you're being lowered into um, this world that, you know, people either overlooked or didn't care about. They put an interlude, the second track on the album. And Prodigy was talking mad shit, punch niggas in they face for living. Prodigy is probably one of the best lyricists in hip hop ever as far as being um, so descriptive in pain. Like his his descriptions in pain and torture and is 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 morbid, man. It's it's really deep and you can tell this is someone that suffers from sickle cell and knows how pain hurts physically. So he's trying to let you know all the different things he can do to you and what real pain is. They just felt like everyday street kids telling their story. Having Pete, they, they put together a, a, a masterpiece. You know, it, it was just so influential, man. They made one of the top classics. In order for an album to be deemed a classic, it needs to be strong from beginning to end. With 16 tracks in total, the Infamous didn't disappoint. I mean, listen, it's as cliche as it sounds, my favorite record on the Infamous is always going to be Shook Ones Part 2. Shook Ones Part 2 is just a classic hip-hop joint that stood the test of time. Like, the angst and the anger that that, that that song captures and the violence. Like, I remember hearing stories. I was a little too young to get into the clubs, but it was banned from certain clubs in New York City because fights would break out every time they played this record. Eye for an Eye is definitely a favorite. Um, I don't think you find... Um, Ray and Nas sounding like that very often, and you know, and I, 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 what I love about that is like that's a type of record that was recorded together. You know what I mean? Because it's the, the spirit of the record. There's a consistency throughout that. They had this record called Drink Away the Pain, which is one of my favorites on the album, and they just compared liquor to people. You know what I'm saying? And I thought that was ingenious. It was just another layer to him, like, okay, they could talk about shooting and stab your face with your nose bone and all of that, and they could just be really blatant, but they could also come and be just very abstract and give you um, conceptual rap. I think Drinking With A Pain is a good kind of bridge between Juvenile Hell and and um, The Infamous. It, you know, it kind of feels a bit like rap school. You know, you have Q-Tip on there. Um, there's a lot of wordplay and what they're doing with the symbolism. One of my joints is um, when party's over, get the rest of the crew. Hey, yo, that, Cause that's what happens when the party's over. Like, yo, where the crew at? Everybody done split up trying to talk to girls and all that. It's like, yo, and then it might be beef. So you want to make sure your, your people's is right. Like, yo, that is so ill. No one's ever said like, yo, all right, the party is over now. Let's go get the people. Where, where, yo, where's Sean at? Yo, go get your party over, get, like, that's some real shit for you and your crew to think about. I, I really like Right Back At You, but I was a big Wu-Tang fan. So I think that lent to why I love that record. It was really hard, um, and a lot of the beats on that album was just like, that kick, that snare, and that hi-hat, you heard it, like, that's really all you heard. And then the beat dropped in. Even the skits in between starting beef with like Def Squad and all of them, with Keith Murray and all that, all y'all space getting high. You know what I'm saying? Don't ever talk to me when you see me. I know anything can happen to me or whatever. Get stabbed, shot. Like, Prodigy is just gone. Is he high? Like, what's going on with him? He told me personally during that skit, he wasn't talking about Red Man and Keith Murray, but that, that skit alone, it sparked a big beef between him and Keith Murray, where they've had physical altercations and 
I, I think that that it that it got deaded. I always like survival of the fittest. Give up the goods, you know. Noid had, had had a crazy verse on there, so that was like the introduction to Noid. Right back at you, um, Q. You hectic. Th those are probably some underrated records uh, because what happened at the beginning of the album and the end of the album were so strong. Um, but that 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 middle of the album was so dark, you know. Um, I, it's, I, I just think it's really amazing too. Like the, the music, it really sounds like it's sinking, you know. And it's like you know when you hear on a movie and you hear kind of like that wah, wah, and you know that's sad, but there's humor to it. And it's like, there's kind of just like, you know, doom, doom, doom. And it, it sounds like doom, you know what I mean? It sounds like havoc. And it's, it, it, this is incredible to me. The Temperatures Rising was also a favorite of mine because um, my brother was locked up at the time. And it's a favorite for the same reason why um, Nas One Love is, is one of my favorite joints. You know, they're, they're writing a letter, Mob Deep is writing a letter on the temperatures rising to kill a black to have his brother. Yo, what up black, hold your head wherever you at. Like, you know, he got locked up. So this was like real feelings and, you know, I was like, wow, they almost took the words and the sentiment and the feelings out of my mouth, how I felt about my own brother on that joint. So I always felt really connected to the temperatures rising. Back in 95, there was one place all hip hop artists went to get that New York City seal of approval. And that place was the tunnel. The tunnel, that was a club where you could go and see Biggie and Tupac and Naughty by Nature and whoever was popping, um, just walking among the crowd, having a good time, they perform. And the tunnel was a place that, it was, it was the litmus test for if your shit was hot. You know what I'm saying? Funkmaster Flex, Big Cap, they DJed in there. And if your shit wasn't playing in the tunnel, it wasn't hot. It was even hard to get in the tunnel. We finally got in after numerous attempts. Man, it, it was like, it was a war zone in there, man. You had Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, you had the Bronx, you had dudes coming from Jersey. But Brooklyn was always deep, and we was Brooklyn dudes. So there was only a couple of songs, not even a couple, but there were certain songs that when they came on, you knew you had to walk up to the wall, have your back to the wall, because you didn't know what was going down. You know what I'm saying? And the tunnel, it couldn't just be any old record. Like it couldn't be, it had to be a banger. Like those were the times when, you know, before the, the Louis Vuittons and all of that, girls was going to the clubs and sneakers and Thames. We was in the club with hoodies on. It was hardcore hip hop town. You know what I'm saying? And we was dancing in the clubs at that time. It wasn't like today where you can't even move. Like you got your section and you got your bottles and all of that shit where you can't even fucking move. Like you just you just gotta turn up and all of that. Nah, niggas was breaking a sweat. You know what I'm saying? And some of that music in inspired violence. You know, some of the music inspired a couple of brawls and a couple of fights. But that's what it was, man. You would go to a club back then knowing that there was a big brawl in the club maybe the week before somebody got shot in front of the club. But it was just something about being in the atmosphere where you would literally sometimes risk life and limb just to go and just to hear that music. You know, and around that time, Mob had the hardest joints on the street, you know from Hot 97 playing them constantly to Ralph McDaniels being the go-to video source on TV, you got to see their lifestyle and their demeanor when Shook Ones came out. And they were just basically throwing out that, yo, y'all see us, respect us. If not, you getting it. Certified by the streets, Mob Deep only had one more test to pass, being rated in the Source magazine. It's like even when you think about like uh, the the rating that, that Infamous got in the source, I got a 4.5, which that's superior, which that album was. Um, and you know, you, you you kind of rate albums based on what came out in, in, in 
that moment in that era. Looking back on it, I would give it five mics. But I went, I don't fault the source for doing it because, you know, there's a lot of pressure to write those album reviews, you know what I mean? And it was a great time, so they were probably measuring it off of, they just gave Nas five mics the year before. I feel like, personally, it deserves a five. You know, I don't know if on, on, on the grand scale of everybody else, but I think the source could have gave them a five for that album. Nah, that's a five mic classic. Like, it's, it's, it's five mics. The, the, the album was 16 songs. I think they probably could have did with cutting about two or three off to make it a little bit more concise. But shit, I, you know, you look back at it today, you gotta give it five. And that absolutely was a four and a half mic album when they rated it. They are, they are what made the source rating system what it was when I got there. However, when I got there, there were specific albums that we felt like, oh my God, that was like, that was a classic album when you look back. And so it was almost like saying, well today, and that was 15 years ago or 13 years ago, well today these albums we would consider to be five mic albums because they have, you know, sort of stood the test of time and their classic album. And that's what we did, which was a little controversial even for us, I think as editors at The Source, around 2003, four, whenever that happened. But there were a lot of albums that came out when The Infamous came out that got four and a half. And they just missed it. But when you look at them, you're like, this is, this is a classic. It's one, of the, it's one of the top albums of all time. Like, I, I, I feel like we gotta start redoing all of these hip hop lists, all of these top 10, top 15, top 20 albums all time, top 10, top 15, top 20 MCs all time, uh, top songs all time. Like, we gotta redo all of that shit. We gotta, we gotta rip those lists up and, and, and redo them because um, I think some of the albums like The Infamous and Cuban Links gotta, gotta go up on the, on higher on the list than what they are. Revisionist history makes you feel like, oh, we messed up. But then that time told you what it was. So if it was four and a half then and you didn't feel it, then I don't know if you come back years later and say, yo, we messed up and it should have been this. Yeah, because time made you realize you messed up, not the actual album. Although Havoc mastered the raw sound of Mob Deep, it was the features that put the infamous over the top. Havoc and, 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 and Prodigy held it on their own for, for most of the thing. Like they didn't get saturated with guest appearances, but when they did have guest appearances, it, it really made sense. Raekwon is on the album twice. Uh, of course, we know Wu-Tang Clan was label mates for Mob Deep with, with Loud Records. And it was funny because when I, when I got into the music industry, a few years later after the Infamous came out, um, I was working at Vibe Magazine and we were in the same building as Loud Records. What a dream come true is that. When they came in and Wu was already established, Nas was already, they fit right in with those guys. Like, you know, on the infamous, they got that track, An Eye for an Eye. And that was one of the favorites. It wasn't a single, but it's a standout from that album. Cause it was like, yo, they sound really good with Raekwon. Yo, they sound really good with Nas. And, and they developed the relationship and did more joints down the line. It was like a natural fit and it felt like this vibe in the, in the city. You know, people don't realize in New York, like Brooklyn kind of stays with Brooklyn, Queens kind of stays with Queens. Nobody goes to Staten Island. And here you had th this kind of crew of MCs that weren't linked up by business. They just genuinely liked each other and liked collaborating. And you could hear Queens and Staten Island on the same track. It was dope. I mean, this was at a time, I think, when you only really saw those alliances when the relationships were good. So, you know, occasionally maybe people would have collaborated. Today, I think when you look at hip hop, everyone jumps on everybody's project. That's just something that they do. They need it. They all gotta be on Wiz Khalifa's joint. And, you know, they just start teaming up. But back then, the alliances that were formed within the culture, particularly on Wax, were real. And they had that relationship with Wu-Tang. When you have MCs of that caliber, nobody wants to be the whack one. Like you not, especially if I'm having a prodigy, like yo, you're not gonna come in on my album 
and outdo me. And Nas was the man, and, and, and Ray was the man already. You know, Marv have something to prove. So yeah, I feel like whenever you get MCs of that caliber in one room, there's some competition going on. And and you know, another thing about them recording together, which is great, is we found out later when they re-released some of the demos from the Infamous, there's like alternate versions, there were verses being changed. Like it was a true collaboration, man, and that's dope. Everybody forgets Big Noy, man. Big Noy, and that's not even a collab. He's like part of Mob Deep. Even his his uh his little skit rhyme, his little freestyle about him having having to go back and forth to um to jail and stuff, like that was incredible to me. You know what I mean? It was like nice little breaks within the album. Um, but then when you have like superior MCs like Raekwon that's just willing to rock with you. He didn't, he probably didn't even do that many rhymes on some of the Woo Dude solo albums. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like he felt like the big brother of that crew. You know, like I'm gonna jump on this joint with my little duns. Actually Q-Tip knew Ma from when they were way young, like teenagers. And he had tried to get them a deal with Def Jam. And Puff almost signed Mob Deep to Bad Boy at a certain certain point. And uh, you know, that would've like imagine Mob Deep on Bad Boy with, with Biggie and the locks. Like you would have Mob, Big, the Locks, Mace. <sighs> Crazy, right? But Mob Deep was hip hop heads. They were street, but they were hip hop heads. So they got Q-Tip on Drink Away the Pain. Their army suits and Timberland boots, and Q-Tip don't fit in. But then when you heard Drink Away the Pain, and Prize, he's talking about his alcohol addiction. Q-Tip comes and talks about his fashion addiction and does it in a metaphor. It was a that's a dope hip hop moment, man. Like that's an ill hip hop moment. Underrated. Underrated. 1995 gave us an abundance of hip hop talent. But only a select few were chosen for the infamous. Who else would have made sense on this legendary project? I, I think the infamous, this album is just perfect. I wouldn't change anything about it. But if, if there was um, another MC that I would have liked to see them collaborate with in 95, Cool G Rap. You know what I'm saying? They collaborated later on on, on murder music and it was crazy. But uh, I think G Rap and Mob Deep would have made a lot of sense. I think that having a few guest artists, not very many, um, made it what it was. So I personally wouldn't want to see anyone else on it. Like, I, I'm good. I'm good with who they chose. I think that, again, it was a classic album and it had the right ingredients. I'd really like to see some, like, Diamond D and Large Professor. I think Diamond D had a quick wit to him. Um, but, uh, you know, again, it's like very New York. I, you know, I think that'd be kind of interesting. Large Professor's production, and, and, and especially like his drums and, and, and what, what P would, would sound like that. I think Buckshot would have rocked on there. And Buckshot and Mob, they were, it looked, I, I thought early on they were going to be a crew, like um, Black Moon and, and having them, because they, they were doing joints with each other for, mainly though, on um, Black Moon stuff. And I thought that was gonna be something because it was like, you know, the hood shorty dudes that 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 have mad heart. I mean shit, I would have loved to see him do something with Piggy. I would have loved to hear Big go verse for verse with, with Prodigy at the time. Like Hav was nice, but Prodigy, you could tell he was he was clearly a little uh, ahead of ahead of him at that time. I I, I think Hav is uh, you know have has definitely stepped it up and he, he was dope on the infamous but you know prodigy was just slightly more advanced i, I would have loved to see big and, and p go toe to toe that shit would have been crazy mike geronimo probably would have been dope on some mob deep stuff like it, it would have been more true and natural to actually like what they did um they collaborated with cormega later but i you know it, it'd be it would have been ill to see cormega um matched up with like rapper Noy uh, on something that sounded like eye for an eye but instead of like those two big guys we know like these two young guys who, who, who are hungrier so I you know I would, I would have rather just seen stuff that was like a natural extension to what they were already doing. 20 years later hip-hop still remains strong as an art form. If you could take any MC back to 95 who would it be? I would love to take someone like Nicki Minaj. I'd like to see Freddie Gibbs. I would put Nipsey Hussle. I think Rick Ross would fit in. Jeezy would sound crazy on some of them heavy beats. I think she is very talented, so she would 
survive in that era. I don't think a lot of artists would be able to survive because you really had to be special to to get out there. Nowadays, it's very easy to get your music out there. And, you know, of course, with social media, everybody's an artist. But back then, to be recognized, signed to a label, you know, released, promoted, you had to have the talent. I think Ross, just because Ross is still kind of that street Don kind of persona, but he's a real hip hop head, so I think him and Prodigy could have came up with something else. I had a chance to sit in the studio with Chance the Rapper a few weeks ago, definitely him. Speaking of Chance, you know him and Action Bronson got the record, and Action is definitely cut from that cloth. People compare Action and Ghostface a little bit, um, but I, I, I love what Action is doing, man, and he could fit right into you know, the stuff that Mob did. I, I think Gibbs has a fantastic voice and he's he's very like, um, I don't wanna say confrontational, but he, you know, he's very direct. He, he, he's very direct and I think some of Mob's best production um, from the infamous and, 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 you know, certainly Hell on Earth in, in that era, it, it was appropriately direct as well. You know, Mob later tried to like expand and they would have records that kind of have more of a club feel. But you know, like the the uh, the best like club record is really just an extension of what you're doing already without trying to force a club record. And so like something with like P, um, have Schoolboy Q, some random chick from the hood hood like singing the hook. You know what I'm saying? Like Tequita or something like that. Like that that I think that would have been kind of like an L experiment. I like Nipsey a lot, man. I, I like the fact that he's like a real cat. A real cat that rap, and that's how I, I view Mob Deep and them, like just real dudes that rap. 1995 was also a very controversial year for hip hop. As the East West View reached new heights, Mob Deep made sure New York City stood strong. When when they did New York, New York, I believe it was at the height of everything that was going on the East and West Coast beef, and it was such a dish to New York. I mean, you all I remember is Snoop coming through, like stepping on buildings, like what? <laughs> We're running this rap stuff, right? And at the time he was, he had a point, in music at least. It depends on how you look at it and how you judge what's successful. I mean, but you know, there was a time where the West was definitely dominating. I mean, my was New York, you know what I'm saying? Like when, when you thought about NYC, you thought about Biggie, you thought about Wu-Tang, you thought about Nas, you thought about Mob Deep. Like, they didn't give a fuck at the time. And I don't know if they still do. When, when I saw that they spoke up and they said something, I was like, oh, all right, you know, New York got a handle on it. At least they said something. And um, it was just funny. I, at this time, I think around that time, I was interning at Bob and um, I remember that was like the talk of the office that day when, when that came out. Um, it's just wild to see that it took them to do that. Like they took it upon themselves. They'd be like, yeah, we gonna go at these dudes. And it was commendable. Somebody was standing up for New York. Man, they was young, they was brash, and you know, very prideful. It's a pride for your city, man. Like. You, you know, you couldn't just talk about New York, New York, come here and start kicking the buildings. And the funny thing was, the Dog Pound New York, New York, New York joint wasn't really even a diss record when you listen to the lyrics. Like, it, it wasn't really saying nothing besides the hook, but you know, you come through and kick down the buildings and there's a visual of that. So, if Mob Deep is the street, if they're like the muscle, and CNN is the muscle in Queens is really rough and, and grimy, I mean, those cats felt like, yo, you, we wouldn't go to LA to do that, so we're not gonna let LA come here to do that. It it was an interesting time. I mean, it made for some really great music, but obviously there was some unfortunate fallout during that too. So it's hard to like all the way celebrate it, you know what I mean? But it, it was great music at that time. When Trinidad James said something about New York, it ain't gonna go. Somebody got to check them, you know? Man, no check them. I think a lot of it was like the microphone was on them, the spotlight was on it, and you know they were young and. That, that type of thing uh, had a gravity to it that it, it really meant everything to them to represent. That was really the essence of hip hop too back then. 
The infamous laid the foundation for Mob Deep and solidified their placement among hip hop's elite. 20 years later, their legacy still lives on. I feel okay putting, putting um, Mob Deep in the top five greatest hip hop groups of all time. I think that's fair and accurate. And Run DMC, I think, were our first true superstars. They had movies, um, they had Adidas, they had endorsements. Like everything that we celebrate rappers for today, like Run DMC was getting it. Plus, they had the first crossover record when they um, collaborated with Aerosmith on Walk This Way. Like, that was, so you know, you gotta tip the hat to them. NWA popularized gangster rap and really push that envelope forward. I don't, I, I don't know if there'll be a mob deep without NWA, you know? If we said groups, then 10. If we're saying artists, I'll put them in my 15. I mean, to this day, Mob and Locks are still like my favorite groups. You know what I'm saying? Of course, Wu-Tang and Tribe, but like that was the other thing too about Mob Deep, which was so dope, is that they came with their own slang. They had the Dunn language, the Danny, um, Dunn, and the Linden, and it was, man, they, 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 it was just trailblazing so crazy. I also think um, the complexity in Prodigy's rhymes influenced a lot of cats that came after him because he was very complex. Um, a lot of, of artists were, but I know that back then he was definitely on that top whatever list. I don't wanna say five, 10, cause I can't think right now of how many people would be up there, but he was on that list of MCs that you looked at like, okay, Prodigy is, is one of, of the hottest. I think Mob's influence is, um, I, I think it's underrated because they they were able to have their own popularity in this era against Nas and Jay and, and Big and Wu-Tang. And you know, I, I think because of that, I think people looked at that younger MCs and they're like, yo, I can make this music like this, it's aggressive um, and it's uncut and it represents who I am. When you grow up together, and especially like the era of Infamous and how young they were, what they were doing on that album meant everything to them. And, you know, to, to, to get older and you have all that and to still be putting it together and, and, you know, not every album is as classic as the infamous, but, you know, they've they've put out a lot of ill albums since then and, and you know, and they're still putting out records. So, you know, I, I think being able to see that more than anything is just a, a huge influence to, you know, certainly New York, but hip hop, hip -hop in general. In general. Thank you.